It's the Star Wars Christmas Special, starring questionable ethics, moral dilemmas, murder, likable characters who won't survive, and lumpy. Eh, I've seen weirder Christmas specials. It's me, Aaron, Professor Thorgy, and welcome to another episode of Thorgy Reviews, the review show where I tackle everything from the world of geekery, and it's time for my annual Christmas tradition, reviewing the latest Star Wars film. Well, it's weird that five years ago I didn't think I'd be saying any of those words. Or at least not looking forward to saying any of those words. Now I'm of course talking about Rogue One, and this movie's a big deal because this really is the first brand new Star Wars film that we've gotten. I know you're going to say, well, what about Force Awakens? Force Awakens was a new chapter in the Star Wars story. This one feels like it's an actual addition to this universe. It doesn't feel like it's continuing that story that we've had going since the originals. It feels like it's actually building on this universe. It feels like it's got brand new characters, brand new story, a brand new tone, a much darker tone that we have not seen in any of the previous films. This movie is, to the previous Star Wars films, what the Netflix series are to the Avengers. Yeah, okay, we know about the big, bright, shiny superheroes bowing off in make-believe Asgard land. What's going on in Harlem? What's going on in Hell's Kitchen? What's going on in the dark back alleys that no one wants to talk about? Now, I will say it's not entirely new, because this does still connect back to the original films, because this is the story of that team that went in and stole the plans for the Death Star. Now, I'll admit I knew that there was a team that went on this dangerous mission to get the plans for the Death Star. I never really thought twice about them. I never really cared about learning their story. And that's the first thing that I have to applaud about this film, is that this movie came in here and showed us that even if we are going back and revisiting films that we have seen before, films that Disney can't really change by taking anything away from it, it lets me know Disney can still change those original films by adding things onto it. Disney can add dimensions to it because after you watch this film, you look at episode four in a completely new light. I mean, for crying out loud, this film actually explained why the Death Star, the biggest weapon that the Empire has, has a hit here to destroy this entire thing button and no one on the ship ever went, hey, you know what, maybe we should cover that up. Maybe it's not a good idea to just have that sitting right there. This film actually made an already great film even better by adding new dimensions to it. That is amazing. I just have to say, Disney, way to go. Now, could you try and tackle the prequels next? Because if you can make this film better, imagine what you could do with this. I mean, if all we need is just new movies to make the old ones even better, give us a new movie about Count Dooku, the clones, that weird pod racing salamander monkey. I try not to learn the names of anyone from the prequels. Now, I'm not really going to get into the story that much because the story is actually kind of simple. I kind of already just summed it up for you. It's the story of the team that went and stole the plans for the Death Star. This film starts off with Diego Luna's character and his trusty robot KS-20 going out and finding this rebel Jin Erzo, who is the daughter of the person who designed the Death Star because they believe she can help them get those plans. So they then go out and they visit a temple where they find this blind monk and his friend who I actually don't really know his story but he carries a giant turret on his back and that told me pretty much everything that I needed to know and then they pick up an Empire pilot who defected and that's pretty much it. They then go and get the plans. Okay, there's a couple of other things in there that happen but I don't really want to spoil it but for the most part that's pretty much the story and I'm going to applaud this film a lot. But I do have to start with a couple of my problems with it. And one of my problems is that this story is pretty simple. It's pretty much a wham bam, just the facts kind of story. In fact, pretty much all my problems with this film kind of stem from just how simple it is. Because, listen, I like the history of the Star Wars films. I like the world of the Star Wars films. I like the political twists and turns that the stories always take. However, the thing that I always loved about the Star Wars films were the characters. It was Luke, and Leia, and Lando, and Han, and Chewie, and Obi-Wan, and Darth Vader, and Poe, and Finn, and Rey. 
All those characters I found to be really dynamic, really entertaining. You instantly got to know them when you met them. I thought the characters were always the strongest thing about the Star Wars films. And in this film, you know, I like, I like the, uh, I like the monk and the gunner. They were pretty cool. They had personality. Uh, KS-20, easily the best droid that we have gotten in one of these films. Uh, the pilot from the Empire who defected, you know, he got an arc. And that was cool. It was cool to watch him change. But uh, Jin Erzo and Diego Luna's character, they are hands down the flattest characters I have seen in a Star Wars film. And I'm including the prequels in that. I hate... That actually hurt to say right there. Oh my god. It's like I just heard the crying of a thousand fans at once. Yeah, I honestly found them to be really flat, and that was a huge problem because they were the stars. They were the two protagonists of this film. If I should have gotten an attachment to anybody, it should have been them, and I got almost nothing. I don't even remember Diego Luna's character's name. That's how little attachment I got to either of them. Now, when we first meet Diego Luna's character, he starts this whole film off by doing something cold blooded. It is so cold blooded, I had to sit there and just go, oh my god, this is the guy we're going to be following for the next two hours. I actually have to applaud Disney for that. Because everybody thought Disney was going to come in here and make the Star Wars universe even softer and more family friendly and happier and more upbeat. And this was them coming out here and going, there are no Ewoks to be found here, okay? There's no Jar Jar Binks going to show up. This is the dark side of the Star Wars universe, and that was the whole point of this film, so I have to applaud Disney for being willing to do that, but also, it let us know instantly what type of person Diego Luna's character was. But that was it. After that moment, he really doesn't have much character outside of, I'm the guy who does the thing. I will now go and do the thing. Here are your orders. Your orders are to go and do the thing. Then I will go do the thing. Should I really do the thing? Yes, you should do the thing. Then I will go and do the thing. In fact, the big turning point for his character is the moment when he decides not to do the thing. I needed way more from him than just that. And as for Jin Erzo, we see her as a kid, but she doesn't really do much as a kid, so we don't really get much from that. And then we find out that she used to work with this extremist rebel. So we know that about her past, but we don't really see any of that playing into her character in the present. And we do see her on a prison transfer ship, and she has to break out of that. And so it lets us know she's kind of a badass. Okay, we get to know that. But then pretty much the rest of her character throughout this film is... Yeah, you see her on the poster there? That's her throughout this entire film. And... I know what they were going for. I know they wanted her to be the strong, silent type, which is cool. You can make a strong, silent type type of character, but they overdid it. She's too silent. I mean, if you watch the trailer, it really does give you a sense of who she is and makes her look like this dynamic character, but everything you saw in the trailer is pretty much what she does in this movie. So take that and then stretch it out over two hours and then fill in in between each of those moments just... That's kind of what I got from her in this film. And even the characters who I did like, I didn't really get a sense of camaraderie from them because this story just moves way too fast. It just is constantly moving from place to place to place to place, plot point to plot point. And because of that, the characters never really have a moment to sit down and talk. They never have a moment to bond. They never have a moment to grow. And because of that, I just couldn't really buy them as a group, or I couldn't really buy some of the decisions that they were making. As I said, Diego Luna's big change is when he decides to not do the thing, and I looked at all the other things he had done, and the stuff that led up to this moment, I went, there is no reason why you wouldn't do the thing all of a sudden now. After everything that you have done, all the stuff that just happened would not be enough to convince you to not do this thing. Or right after that, Jin Erzo gives this big speech about hope. And it's a good speech. It is a darn good speech. But I looked at it and went, Sure, I can buy you saying that, I guess. But man, it would make way more sense for Donnie Yen's monk to come in here and say that. Because 
I still really just get the sense that you're just kind of jaded and don't want to be here. I don't really buy that your character has grown enough to the point in which you would give this big moving speech about hope. You know what this film is? This film is 10 minutes away from perfect. Because if you would come in here and just add 10 more minutes to this movie of these characters just growing and talking and exploring themselves and talking back and forth and us getting a sense of how the things that we have seen have changed them, I would totally buy it. I would have no complaints about this. I would fully be all in. But we didn't get those 10 minutes. So I am not fully all in. And honestly, the plot moving so quickly kind of hurts the story as well because it just left me so often in this film saying, wait, hold on, I, I think I know it's, wait, so you're going here now because of this thing? I constantly had to remind myself why they were doing things in this film. For example, they go to this Jedi temple, something happens and they escape, and they escape with the blind monk and the gunner who they just met, and at no point do they then turn to them and go, hey, we're going to our next mission, um, are you cool with joining us on this, or is there somewhere you'd like us to drop you off right now? Because, yeah, they just instantly meet these guys, something happens, and it is indeed a big thing, but now these guys are just instantly part of the team, and that's it. There's no discussion about this at all. They're there now. And this is a story that really does just kind of throw you right into the middle of it. Like, I fully understand that this is not a film for people who have not seen the other Star Wars films. That should be obvious, but there are moments in here where it feels like you need to not only see the previous Star Wars films, you need to also read all the plot synopses that were coming out about this film in Entertainment Weekly months before this film actually came out in order to fully grasp everything that's happening. Like, it almost feels like this movie wanted to turn to the audience and go, you know what we're doing, right? Yeah, you, you all read this online, right? You know what we're doing? Okay, cool, let's just go to the next location. Because there's so many things that they just instantly know, and they just instantly know they need to be somewhere. It's almost like this film was trying to set up Rogue Zero, a prequel to this prequel, where you follow the team that found out all the information that this team needs. So yes, as I said, the story jumps around a bit too much, and the two protagonists are pretty flat, and honestly, I was very nervous about criticizing that, because as I said, it's Star Wars. This is a franchise that is known for having dynamic characters, but then I remembered who directed this. The director of this film is the same guy who directed the last American Godzilla film, another movie that had great supporting characters, but the protagonist... What was his name again? Chuck Steak? Buff McLarge Huge? Yeah, I don't remember. Point is, the guy doesn't really direct the most dynamic protagonist. But you know what he does well? Tension, giant levels of destruction, horror, all things that are also in this film, and they are perfect. And yes, I know that in my reviews, I love to throw the word perfect around when I just mean it's really, really good. No, no, no. When this film does something right, it is perfect. Perfect. Yes, even during the first two acts, where I had all those problems with the characters and the way that the story was being paced out, the action was so good, and the tension rised at the perfect pace that it kept me engaged and allowed me to look past all those problems I might have had, because when this story wants to get emotional, it gets emotional. When it wants to get disturbing, it gets disturbing. When this movie wants to shock you, it will shock you. I kid you not, I have never said, Oh, more than I have while watching a movie than when I was watching this movie. Sometimes I said that because there was just a really great line being delivered. Sometimes I said that because there was an action scene that was just mind-blowing. Sometimes I said that because the emotions in the scene were just overwhelming. And that is the entirety of the third act. Yes, I know I said I had problems with the first two acts of this film because I wasn't really that invested in the characters and the story moved at kind of an odd pace. However, when you hit that third act, when they're actually going to steal the plans for the Death Star, and they are all together and they realize not all of them are going to return from this mission, everything works. Just to give you an example of the kind of action scenes that I'm talking about, I don't want to spoil anything, although I do have a spoiler talk that's already up and you can see it by clicking on the card that just popped up right now, so I don't want to spoil anything. However, 
You know how they are trying to steal the plans of the Death Star, and the Death Star is this giant weapon that can destroy plants? In New Hope, we saw what that looked like when they destroyed a planet from space. In this, you actually see what it's like to be on a planet as it's being destroyed. And when that's happening, you have trouble breathing because it's one of the most intense things I've seen in a movie all year. And just to talk about the emotional moments in this film, listen, there were characters who I knew flat out were not going to survive through this film, and yet, still when it happened, I found myself getting choked up. I found myself actually caring about them in that moment. And there were other characters who I knew would survive this movie. And they didn't! And I had trouble accepting that because I had grown so attached to them. And that's the truly amazing thing, is as I said, I wasn't attached to any of these characters during the first or second act, but in the third act, when you see them struggling and fighting so hard with everything going wrong and then having to fix everything on the fly to make this work, seriously, Isaac Clark didn't have to fix this much broken crap in space. When you see them working and struggling that hard, it undid those problems. It made me actually care. It made me get invested. It made me want to see them succeed. It made me wonder if they would succeed, even though I know the entire trilogy that came before this is based on the fact that they did succeed. That's how good that third act is. It made me care about characters I had no attachment to just 10 minutes ago. And honestly, that's what made me love this movie. That's what made me want to recommend it to people. That's what makes me want to go back and watch it again, is the fact that it ends on such a high mark. Yes, I had promised throughout the first hour of this film, but when you leave the theater, that last half hour is going to stick with you. That is what you are going to look back on years from now and remember about this film, and it's what's going to make you want to recommend it to other people and get other people to go and see it with you so that you can all experience that amazing last half hour. You know what this movie is like? This movie is like going out to a big meal that you've been looking forward to for years. This is a giant special meal that you're going out to, and then the appetizer, eh, it's okay. Then the main course is kind of basic, gonna use some more time being cooked. But then the dessert is the most succulent, sweet, tasty thing you have ever shoved in your mouth. And I'm not talking about some five-star gourmet dessert where it's like 60 bucks for a brownie. No, 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 not talking about that. I'm talking about a real dessert. This movie is like if a tiramisu made love to a red velvet cake and then you just shove cookie dough ice cream all over it. In fact, I say we make that a real thing and we call it the Rogue One because eating it would indeed be a suicide mission. So in the end, is this the best Star Wars film? I can't go that far, however I would put it in the top three. And I also really do have to applaud Disney for being willing to go dark with what has become a family friendly franchise for a film that did indeed need to be dark. And as I said, this film isn't just good on its own. It makes A New Hope even better. Seriously, if you are a big Star Wars fan, you would be doing yourself a disservice to not watch this film and then immediately go home and instantly start up New Hope because this film adds such a new layer to that film that it will make you watch New Hope in a brand new light. And not in the way that the prequels made you watch New Hope in a brand new light. Seriously, Disney, thank you for making this, but for your next trick, could you fix the midichlorians? Could you resolve that in some way, shape, or form? That's it for me, everyone. Let me know in the comments down below how you felt about this film, or just let me know anything at all down in the comments below, because honestly, YouTube has changed its algorithm around again, and now the way that channels get funded and they get found by other people is no longer based upon views, but instead by number of comments and likes. So there's that. I asked a representative from YouTube why they decided to do this, and they replied, I find your lack of faith disturbing. Yay! I was able to fit Darth Vader in here somewhere. Anywho, thanks again for watching, everybody. Make sure to follow me here on this channel, but also on other forms of social media at Twitch and Tumblr and Twitter at Professor Thorgy, and make sure to come back next time for another episode of Thorgy Reviews. Bye, everyone.